With the P-47 Thunderbolt, the United States Army Air Force, the USAAF, got themselves a winner. Though a rather big brute, the P-47, with its huge double wasp engine and firepower of 850 caliber machine guns that could mincemeat just about anything when it entered service in 1942, was arguably the first American fighter of the Second World War capable of matching those of other nations on a better than equal footing. Sure, the P-40 held its own, no denying that, but it was more a case of being good enough rather than excelling. And the P-38 was a fine long-range high-altitude fighter, but it could have problems down low in a dogfight until hydraulically boosted aerolons were fitted later in the war. But the P-47 was the first of the American wartime fighters that could not just hold its own, but happily go toe-to-toe with Axis aircraft across most altitude ranges, shred enemy ground forces with its formidable attack capability, and suck up stupid amounts of punishment. Sure, the Thunderbolt had places that it could be improved, but that too was recognised. If the big juggernaut, or jug as it was affectionately nicknamed, was to retain its edge, it needed its performance to continue to improve as the fighters of enemy countries also got better. I talked in my previous video on the XP-47H about how the USAAF was keen to see what could be wrung out of the Thunderbolt airframe by fitting a liquid-cooled engine. But even before this effort, an attempt was made to see what could be done by making modifications to the existing power plant and lightening the airframe. In fact, this was proposed in November 1942, the very same month the baseline P-47 entered service, when Republic suggested to the USAAF that they build a lightened experimental P-47. Obviously, everyone was rather busy at the time, what with the whole getting involved in World War II, but the Air Force signed a contract the following June for the construction of two prototypes, with the aircraft receiving the designation of XP-47J. The most notable difference between the XP-47J and the standard jug was the alterations to the engine mount and nose. The engine was changed out for a Pratt & Whitney R2800 57C radial engine that had a standard rated output of 2,100 horsepower, but in war emergency setting could produce 2,800 horsepower. But in contrast to the original P-47 with its radial engine cooled by direct airflow, the P-47J had a tight cowling fitted to enclose the engine and cooling was achieved by an intake fan and a new chin scoop. Inlets were also fitted to provide air for the turbo supercharger and the exhaust system altered so that it vented out of ventral ports that would provide the aircraft with additional thrust. Because the aim was to see what could be achieved with the P-47, other measures were taken to improve the aircraft's performance. Armament was reduced to six Browning machine guns in the wings and ammunition cut down to 267 rounds per gun. The rear fuel tank and the radio equipment was also removed, and to keep the airframe as aerodynamically clean as possible, the XP-47J had no provision for external ordnance or drop tanks. Initially, it was hoped to fit a contra-rotating propeller to the aircraft, but delays with this meant that the idea was shelved, and it was decided to use the second prototype to test this. It was also intended that this second aircraft would also have a bubble canopy, which was soon to become standard on the production Thunderbolts. As the idea was that the design would provide an improved aircraft off the basic P-47 frame, which in turn meant that hopefully it could go into production on the existing lines with minimal disruption and complications, things moved pretty quickly. Because it was basically a converted P-47D of Razorback type taken straight off the line, the XP-47J first flew in November 1943, just five months after the contract for its building was issued and the modifications certainly achieved their basic intentions, with the XP-47J shaving around a thousand pounds off the flat weight of the standard P-47D. This made it fast. In July 1944, Republic decided to see just what they could get out of the aircraft, and fitted it with a new propeller and a General Electric CH-5 turbocharger. With these modifications, and flying over a calibrated course in August 1944, the Republic test pilot reportedly measured a top speed of 505 miles per hour. It also had a heck of a climb rate, capable of reaching 30,000 feet in 6 minutes and 45 seconds. 
All this would make the XP-47J the fastest piston-engined fighter of all time, and justified its nickname as the Super Bolt. However, it should be pointed out that these results were never replicated, and when the USAAF took possession of the aircraft that December and began their own test program, they only ever achieved a top speed of 484 miles per hour, which to be fair is not bad, but was achieved at the cost of the exhaust manifold failing. Indeed, the Super Bolt suffered a number of issues during its development, not really surprising considering the aircraft was pushing the envelope, but the engine had to be switched out due to the amount of wear it suffered after only 10 hours of flight testing. Plus, the second prototype ultimately never got built, limiting the XP-47J to just a single aircraft. This was partially due to the fact that Pratt & Whitney never sorted out the issues with this specialist contra-rotating propeller system that was intended to be fitted, but also to the fact that Republic itself had rapidly lost interest in the idea of a production P-47J. For starters, the hope had been, as said, that the type could be built on the existing P-47 production line with minimal disruption. But it turned out that only 30% of the aircraft was the same as the P-47D, and as a result, switching to the P-47J as a production standard would require a large amount of retooling, just as the requirement for fighters was at its height. And after all, as history has shown, the P-47D was more than adequate for the job at hand, so why mess around with things? Plus, Republic had even grander schemes in mind. In July 1943, just a month after they received the contract to build the XP-47J prototypes, they issued a report saying that, actually, the XP-47J likely wouldn't be worth the effort and that they would be better off devoting their resources, and the USAAF's money, to their next generation of fighter, the XP-72 Ultra Bowl. The USAAF agreed with their assessment, and subsequently cancelled the second prototype. This was probably the right decision, and the Ultra Bolt would fly only three months after the XP-47J first did, and likely had more development potential. But ironically, the XP-72 also never saw service, as jets were to rapidly spell the end for the piston engine fighter era. But to return to the Super Bowl, it remained essentially a testbed. Though the efforts expended on it certainly don't seem to have been wasted, as they seem to have been running side by side with another effort that Republic was working on, the XP-47M. This unofficial development and test program also looked at modifying the standard P-47 with the R2800C series engine used by the 47J, but with less structural changes. And this would all pay off, along with Republic's experience in working with the C series engine and the CH-5 Turbo in the Super Bowl, when an urgent requirement for an extremely fast interceptor was issued to deal with a new threat the V-1 flying bombs that started hitting the UK in June 1944. Republic were able to turn out 130 of the M models in reasonably short order, though not soon enough for them to see use against the doodlebugs, but they would be the fastest piston engine aircraft to see service with frontline units during the Second World War. So while the XP-47J never lived up to its potential, and would have been eclipsed in short order even if it had gotten into service, it does deserve note for being the fastest piston engine fighter ever built, and helping in the development of a sibling that would hold the same accolade as the fastest service fighter during the Second World War. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please remember to share on other social media sites, drop a like maybe, leave a comment, maybe subscribe. Have a good one guys, and I'll catch you on the next video.